All right. So this week, what we're going to do is our first case study. So this is week three, lecture one. So case study one. which is the PS2 uh, interface. So what I'll do is that the goal of this case study is to help you understand. So the goal of this case study is help you understand protocol interfacing. So how do you interface your FPGA to an external device? It's actually help you review protocol interfacing because you should have done this not only in 2902 but your other digital systems classes. So the PS2 interface is an example of a bidirectional protocol. Okay. Uh, so it will transmit and receive on one data line. And the reference for this is chapter 16 in your book. So Chu has some nice reference designs which you can use if you want, if you don't want to write it from scratch, but that involves you understanding how his reference design works and putting a top level wrapper around it. So in lecture uh, today, we will discuss the nuances of the PS2 protocol. Next lecture, I will show how to put a top level wrapper around choose PS2 mouse interface, okay? Your lab is the PS2 keyboard interface, and you can get these PS2 keyboards from the Tech Support Center, okay? They have a whole bunch of them if you don't have one. Uh, but what I wanted to say was, as long as the, as far as the lab is concerned, so we go into your syllabus. The lab is simply asks you to, based on the description of a PS2 mouse interface, design an interface so that you can send commands to the keyboard. Okay, in the from in the case of the mouse, you just receive command, receive your whatever coordinates, button presses from the mouse. Um, and the way you demonstrate the design works is you change the status LEDs on your keyboard, right? Num lock, scroll lock, caps lock. So let's say you hook them up to a switch. Right, so you make the switch go up, the LEDs turn on, for example. So that's your lab two. Okay. So as a general, so we're getting into the idea of uh, like basically project ideas. Right. So there are, and I've talked about this pretty much in all my classes. Uh, you want to approach problem solving by four steps. Okay. This is by George Polya's book, or this is from George Polya's book called How to Solve It. He's a famous mathematician. Right? And it's a very, very good book on problem solving. So he basically identifies four steps okay, to solving any problem. Step one is you have to understand the problem. Okay. Step two is devise a plan. Step three is carry out the plan. And step four is check your answer, carry out the plan. So four is check your answer. So I just realized it in the sense, uh, you could some potentially map this into the scientific method, right? Because that's the uh, mother of all problem solving techniques. So what is the scientific method? What's the first step in the scientific method? or you come up with a hypothesis. Okay. Hypothesis. And then what is the next step? 
No, you make a prediction based on your hypothesis, right? So you make a prediction based on the hypothesis and you could say this is equal to device a plan because to make a prediction, you have to think about how to do the prediction, right? So for example, uh, let's say we are in research, we're investigating a new problem. Uh, we have to first of all figure out what is so, so as a specific example, uh, let's say we are we are trying to identify the ideal memristor. So the hypothesis we came up with is that the ideal memristor comes out because of the AC Josephson effect, and not the DC Josephson effect. Turns out the hypothesis is wrong. I figured it out over the weekend. So we have to go back and refine our hypothesis, right? So how do we figure out that it's wrong? Well, you look at what work other people have done. There's always somebody who has done some work related to what you're thinking, right? Of because of the amount of knowledge which we as humans have accumulated over the past like thousands of years, whatever. But anyway, so based on the hypothesis, we have like a particular hypothesis for the ideal memristor. We come up with a prediction, right? So this is how it should happen. Then, or this is what should happen given these experimental conditions. Based on this prediction, so put a double arrow that is go back and forth and fix it, right? Based on this prediction, you come with an experiment, right? So you say that, all right, this is the experiment we have to do. And so then you test your, so based on the results of this experiment, you either come up with a theory all right, or you go back and fix your hypothesis, etc. So it's very similar. That's why I put a like dashed line in the sense it's not exactly the same, but it's same idea, right? In other words, where it really applies to you is you really cannot skip any of these steps. You can't really devise a plan unless you don't understand the problem, right? So we really, in our Josephson Junction Ideal Memorister, Yovan and I have been working on this for almost a year and a half. On the hypothesis itself just can't jump to this if you don't understand the problem and that might take years in your case you don't have years or you have two weeks because it's not a difficult problem so one of the things we as faculty were discussing in our department meeting is we were discussing about how when you get into senior design people just try to build a circuit without build something without even simulating etc it just doesn't work Trust me, you don't want to do that. You want to take at least like a few weeks understanding the problem. I don't know how long it'll take. For example, I'm advising a master's student at MSOE right now. She took the entire summer trying to understand the problem. Right? It takes a long time. It's not very simple. And it's better if you learn how to do this now than when you get into like senior design, etc. Right? So. So to understand the problem, what do we got to do? Well, so step one, understand problem is basically, in your case, you have a book which pretty much tells you what the protocol is about. It also gives you reference design. So let's look at uh, understanding the problem. So let me whip out your book. And let's just go through it. Where is your book? There is. Oops. Uh, embedded SOP design. Let's see. It's chapter 16. I don't know what page it is actually. Let me just do a binary search. Go to 350. This is 14. So uh, this is 450. Let's try this again. There it is. So Chu gives this entire program listing. Oh, let's see. Let's try. It's a pretty long chapter. Let's go to 400. Aha. So there's a nice. It's a very nice chapter, right? So here is the protocol. Okay, 
for the PS2 interface. And if you, first of all, you have to say it says PS2 device to host timing diagram. Okay. What does that mean? So to understand that, well, here is your FPGA board or your FPGA device. Okay, I'll just write FPGA. So here is, this is the host. Okay. And this is the PS2 device. This is the target. Yeah. So notice that this is device to host timing. Right. So this is, uh, 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 and here is the host to device timing. So there are, depends on how you're transmitting data, you have to look at the correct timing diagram. And they're actually not that much different in the sense that this timing diagram actually is shows how choose design works. Okay. Point number one. Point number two, if you look in his, uh, the way he specifies oops, finite state machines, he uses something called as the algorithmic state machine chart with data path. We will go through it shortly, but it is not very difficult to understand in the sense it's basically like a state transition diagram. But first, let's look at the PS2 protocol itself, which is this one. So let me zoom in. So 16.1. All right, so here's the protocol. protocol here. All right, what can you tell me about the, what are some points, some notes on the protocol? What do you see looking at this picture? It has eight bits of data, eight bits of data, plus what? What else does it have? Start bit, start stop, guard intervals. Okay, start um, plus start stop bits. These are just brain dumps. Okay, start stop bit plus what? It's got a parity bit. Okay. What else can you tell me about this? Hmm? So seems like data is um, registered, not latched on falling edge of clock, okay, what else? Sorry? So potentially state machine uh, registers on rising edge of the same clock but this is a detail which we will look at when we design the state machine. So, but let's just write this down for now. State machine registers on rising edge. I'll put a question mark, right? That is, if it's the state machine puts data, let's say on the rising edge of the clock cycle, then your, actually this is the PS2 device to host. So let's say, uh, yeah the device puts it on the falling edge and the state machine samples it on the rising edge, we should be okay, right? That's what it looks like. What else do you see from here? So the serial protocol, yes? So like, what can you tell me about the format of the serial pro protocol? The format is little Indian, okay? So the least significant bits come out first, all right, so that's important. And actually, that's about it, all right? Uh, so now what we will do is we have to understand the details in the sense, uh, for example, the start condition is pull the data line low while the clock line is held high, yes? And the stop condition is pull the data line high while clock is high, there you go, all right? So we always manipulate the data line. 
So data line goes high to low while the clock is high, is start condition. And then what the protocol expects is it expects you to send eight bits followed by a parity bit, followed by the stop condition, okay? This is when you're going from device to host, okay? That is, you're going this way. There is also an acknowledge bit in here. And you can see that in this. Here. So here is the acknowledge bit. Can we have to service that? And we'll look at it tomorrow, in the sense when you look at the design itself. Actually, I'll start looking at the design today. Now, tomorrow, we'll look at a signal tap view of this. Uh, so, that's some points on the protocol itself. Now, as part of understanding the problem, we need to understand the notation of ASMs. So, this is algorithmic state machines. It's easy to understand, okay? It's not that hard instead of a finite state machine. So let's look at that. So there's actually the reference for this. I think it's part of your reading. It's chapter six in your book, specifically section, whoops, 6.1, page 129. So let me just go to that page. Two. So here is an, before we do this, let's just, uh, so this is the, if you will, the most important picture. Oops. Okay. Let's zoom in. So, this is how a finite state machine is specified. Yes. So here is the state name. If it's a more output, you put it in the, in the state like we did, okay? If it's a melee output, you put it over here, and this is the logic expression that leads to the state transition, yes? So this is how we used to say finite state machines. The equivalent is shown here, okay? For an algorithmic state machine chart. So here is the state entry, the arrow which gets us into the state. The state name is given in the top left-hand corner, okay? So if it's a more output, it's given here. The Boolean condition is equivalent to this logic expression. And if your output depends on the input, it's given by this um, non-rectangular, what we call this, symbol, right? Is that clear? That's it. It's, not, it's just notation, right? You don't have to use algorithmic state machine charts. The reason why I covered them is because it's that's what Chu uses. So if you want to copy this, I mean this is the this is all the figure we'll need. So here is our node, all right? The state machines. So here is FSM, here is ASM, and ASMD just means algorithmic state machine with data path, all right? So it includes the control FSM and whatever your data path components are. And the data path components, uh, oops, didn't copy that, are any like standard combinational logic like adders or sequential logic like counter components. Okay, that's what data path is. So data path modules like counters, shift registers, you should know from 2902. If you don't know them, review them, right? Because we'll start using them Especially for, okay, let me ask you this. For this case study to utilize these bits, like so, so to design the data path, what do you think are the components that you will need in the data path? Just looking at this picture, what are the components you think you will need? Yeah. Well, what kind of a component is it? Huh? 
it's a counter you need a counter to count the number of bits yes uh, what else do you need you think register what kind of like yeah register but shift register okay so those are the two main components in this case study counters which you already already utilized in lab one and shift registers so you can shift data so serial to parallel let's say to compare it so in if you look at the design um i'll email you uh, my the top level the, i'll email you the completed quarters project which i'm going to discuss next lecture right so take a look at it and you that's what you'll see you'll see a finite state machine that coordinates between counters and i actually i forgot let's look at it i think there are shift registers in there right does that make sense so that's how you look at not only this design digital logic design but any other design either engineering or science actually for anything that that matters right for for, for that matter anything in the sense you look at um, what are the different sub components of your design and how do you interface between them and that does take experience to do all right so here is the fsm so let's look at the equivalent asm notation and we'll look at an example because we have plenty of time So, whoops. So this is the single symbol of a state in algorithmic state machine notation. I never use ASMs, FYI. I just use finite state machines. Or finite state machine diagrams, sorry. Okay. So there it is. And then let's look at an example. There's an example right on the next page. So here it is. I'm not going to redraw it, right? So let's look at the state machine. So how many inputs do you think the state machine has? How many inputs? Two, A and B, okay? I think it has one output. Yes? Does it have two? Oh, Y0 and Y1. Thank you, all right? So this is a melee output. So this is a melee state machine, all right? Uh, although it does have like outputs so in this case the output y0 is not defined in some ways or right? it just sets output one oh, sorry y1 okay same thing here so let's see how we translate this to a asm chart so first thing is you stay in state as zero as long as your a is zero yes so this is the complement Sometimes they put a bar over it. Okay. So this should be familiar to you from um, 2900. So let's look at this. So notice the name of the state as zero. Yes. Here is my more output. Here is my decision box. So if A is equal to one, it's false. That corresponds to this arc. You stay back in as zero. Is that clear? And then if A is equal to one, all right, you go to here and then you check if b is one right this is a and b so if b is one is true you set y zero to one yes notice the little uh, symbol here it's a melee output yes and then you go to state s2 and you follow this arc back the reason why people use asm charts is it's and sometimes it's easier to represent a design that has data path components with an ASM chart than with a finite state machine. Okay, that's the only reason. And then, so that takes care of this part of the finite state machine. Yes. So this part of the finite state machine is, so if B is not equal to one, so it's A and B not, you go here, more output, all right? Check if A is zero, if it is, Z, uh, let's see. Yeah, if A is zero, you stay back in S1. If it's true, you go back to S0, like that, right? You want to join this one. That's it. So, what we will do is, um, next lecture, we'll look at the ASM chart specification also for the PS2 uh, from Chu. But let's now look at the code, the, I mean, the hardware. I'm going to email you, right? 
So I did this uh, last time, I thought 3921. So this design basically wraps a top level FSM around choose PS2 transmit and receive course instead of a NIOS to top level. Okay, so if you look at choose chapter 16, he talks about how you can also put a NIOS to wrapper. In other words, you can put a wrapper around his design so you can actually hook it up to the NIOS 2 processor, right? Our next case study is the NIOS 2. So this case study, you just get used to doing a quote unquote 2902 like project, right? So 2902, you probably spent four weeks on this. This class, you only spent two weeks on this, okay? So this lab, the way it's uh, lab two, so lab one is due this week, Lab two, the way it works is, so if you look at the schedule, remember that I changed it slightly, in the sense we already talked about signal tap, right? So we will do PS2 today and tomorrow, then we'll get back on, uh, well, quote unquote schedule. But lab one, you have to check off before the start of lab. So you work on lab two this week, um, you continue working on lab two, this is actually incorrect. So strike this off, right? In the sense, uh, you continue working on lab two next week. In week five, is when you do lab two checkoff. Is that clear? So you get two weeks to work on this. The idea is this week you spend time understanding the protocol in lab, etc. Make sure you do design on paper, right? And then starting uh, next week, you spend pretty much the entire week doing lab two, including lab. Is that clear? That's how it's designed. Right? You can try to finish it in one week. That's fine. And then if you finish it in one week. I'll send you the NIA, ask me for the NIOS 2 stuff because I might get my website, my server up and running this week. If I do, then the NIOS 2 materials are already online. You can start it, right? If you finish lab 2, email me about the NIOS 2 stuff and I'll send it to you. Yeah. Okay, so that's the plan. But let's look at uh, the comments. Uh, the design, oh yeah, the other thing, the design was originally implemented on DE2. And if you look at this, okay, caution, this design works for the DE2, right? It will not work on the DE1 directly. So the first thing you have to do is you have to migrate this to the DE1 and that's not hard, right? Basically, as a hint, all you have to do is change these top level assignments. Of course, you have to import the pin assignments again. You have not seen this for the DE1, yes? Because this is the DE2. The only, the things you have to change are the FPGA. You can see that FPGA is not the one you use the top level pin assignments, and then appropriately change these mappings, okay? It's, it's very simple to do. So let's just analyze and synthesize this, and let's look at a top level view. When you're looking at somebody else's design, if it's designed right, then you can look at the RTL view and try to make sense of what's going on, right? So let's do that, and that's about it for this class. Uh, in the sense, uh, next lecture, we'll actually download this I'll probably bring my DE2115 board, right? Uh, download it, look at signal tap, so we make sure we understand the protocol. And what, did it just crash? I have no idea. So. so let's say not responding. Hopefully it didn't crash. Do that, close everything. Yeah, it's synthesizing. It's gonna take some time. So let me pause the lecture, get a drink of water, and then we'll look at the top level, and then we Okay, so while it's synthesizing, let's look at the top level FSM, the wrapper I put around, okay? Uh, notice, again, state memory, nothing except, it's state memory, or it's just a flip-flop, inferred deep flip-flop. What kind of an FSM is this, just looking at this? Can you tell me, is it more or melee? No. Actually, I think it is more, you're right. Because your outputs just depend on the state. They don't look like they depend on the inputs, okay? So that's why, remember I told you, you can put the outputs as a separate, pro separate selected single assignment. So that's what you should do, in the sense if you want it to be clear that it's a more. But anyway, it, it should be a more because the outputs don't depend on the inputs, right? So basically, if you just look at this FSM description, you can see that I have a transmitter receiver, okay? 
and depending on what state I'm in, I enable the transmitter or the receiver. And the, within the transmitter or the receiver, if you think about it, there will be counters and shift registers. They instantiate. Is that clear? So let's look at it. The good news is it's synthesized. Let's look at the warnings. Um, I have a signal tap also in here. Uh, it's giving me a lot of warnings. So it's saying something cannot be tri-stated, and we have to see why. Uh, but I don't remember this design because it's been over a year since I looked at it. But let's look at the good news is there are no latches that are being synthesized. Okay, point number one. Point number two, like I told you, as far as timing closure is concerned, I won't make it compulsory. All right, but if you do timing closure design, I'll give you appropriate extra credit. Okay, it's not easy, and we can talk about it. Right, because first of all, this design is not running on your FPGA. So sorry, I'm sorry, it's running on your FPGA but it's interfacing to an external device, okay? So this design is actually, in some ways, globally asynchronous because you don't know the timing coming from the external device. The PS2 clock is actually, technically, it's asynchronous, right? Because you don't know when the keyboard will send its clock, right? So I think if I remember the protocol, the PS2, key, the PS2 device is what sends out the clock, right? I, I don't remember, right? But the bottom line is the frequency of that clock can vary, right? so it's actually not synchronous. But besides that, there is no way that frequency is up to like 50 megahertz. It's in the hundreds of kilohertz, and you don't, you can't really slow down your master clock because you really don't know what frequency the PS2 device operates at. It's a range of frequencies. Right? So timing closing this is not that easy. Anyway, so let's look at the RTL view, and we'll call it a day. All right, so the top level, so yeah, like I said, there's a signal tap, clock, all right? Uh, so it looks like I'm sending the clock at 40 kilohertz, yes? So what do you think is the maximum frequency in my design? Huh? Yes? No, 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 this is a signal tap clock. 20 kilohertz. So it looks like my PS2 clock is 20 kilohertz. Remember, the sampling clock has to be twice, at least twice the frequency of your, it might be less than 20 kilohertz, okay, but the upper bound on my system clock is 20, I mean, my design clock is 20 kilohertz. And as usual, like I said, it's got a transmit unit and a receive unit, okay? So let's get into the transmit and receive unit, see what they have. You can see within here, it's not, uh, it's got a bunch of multiplexers, all right? It's got this register, this might be a shift register, this might be a counter. I'm, well, I don't know which is which, okay? But basically, that's the idea. So let's look at your top level FSM. There, okay? So let's get in here. All right, so it's idle, right, initially. Remember, you should always have a well-defined idle state, reset state. And then you go to transmit reset, okay? So I guess this is going to reset the PS2 device. That's what it looks like. And after that, I go into my receive acknowledge. Yes? And it's right here. Receive acknowledge reset, right? And from here, I go into this state called, uh, let's see, receive acknowledge reset. And then destination state is, see, there's an extra state here. And then I go into uh, set stream mode. And you can move these around. No, oh, I can't. I should be able to. So basically, it seems like I'm transmitting data, receiving acknowledge, transmitting data, receiving acknowledge. That's what it looks like the top level FSM is doing. Okay. So tomorrow, so what I'll do is uh, in a couple of hours, I'll email you this zipped version, right? So take a look at it. Remember, you can't directly run this on the DE1. You have to, first of all, change the FPGA, change the import new top level pin assignments, and change the top level appropriately, and that's really not hard to do, okay? So you could do that. There's already signal tap in here. Let me see. Let me see if it saved the data. It might have. So you can connect this on the DE1, and yes, it has, All right? Oh, let's see, there, okay? 
So there is the signal tap data, and this is what we will start with next lecture. Question? Okay, so that's about it. Again, I'll send you an email. I'll send you this design zipped. So look at it tomorrow, and that's it. We're done with the PS2. Okay. All right.